presentation. Oh, just getting a notice about the recording there. Got it. Um, as part of the DFA public speaker series in honor of African Heritage Month, which is in February um, each year. And uh, this evening, we're, we're very privileged and, and pleased to be able to have Dr. Isaac Saini give a presentation on uh, Building Black Canadian Studies, Dalhousie's contribution. I will introduce uh, Dr. Saini momentarily. And before I do, just a few housekeeping notes and a territorial acknowledgement uh, to begin. So let me turn to my to my notes. So as I mentioned, the speaker series this evening is in honor of African Heritage Month, the theme of which in Nova Scotia is Seas of Struggle, African Peoples from Shore to Shore. And uh, the idea is to recognize the struggles people of African descent face from the shores of Africa to the shores of Nova Scotia. And as I mentioned, Dr. Isaac Saini, uh, one of our DFA members, will be uh, speaking this evening on um, Black Canadian Studies at Dalhousie in particular. And as I mentioned, a few housekeeping details just to keep things flowing. The presentation, as you may have noticed, will be recorded. Just a number of folks had asked us to do that. We will stop recording before we uh, take questions at the end, just so people can feel free to engage um, in uh, discussion openly and freely. And we'd ask you during the presentation, if you don't mind remaining muted, just to avoid background noise and feedback, that's greatly appreciated. And if you can hold questions, comments till the end, just to allow Isaac an opportunity to get through the presentation. And at that point, we'll just use the raise hand functions just to keep uh, control, make sure folks uh, get a chance to ask what's on their mind. So territorial acknowledgement will begin. Uh, we'd like to acknowledge that we are in Mi'kma'ki, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. This territory is covered by the Treaties of Peace and Friendship, which Mi'kmaq and Maliseet people signed with the British Crown from 1725 to 1761. The treaties did not deal with the surrender of lands and resources, but in fact recognized the Mi'kmaq and Maliseet title and established the rules for what was to be an ongoing relationship between nations. Mi'kmaq treaty rights are constitutionally protected. Mi'kmaq people still live in Mi'kma'ki. We also will acknowledge uh, African Nova Scotian um, heritage. We recognize that African Nova Scotians are a distinct people whose histories, legacies, and contributions have enriched that part of Mi'kma'ki known as Nova Scotia for over 400 years. Yeah, let me uh, take a moment uh, to introduce our speaker this evening, Dr. Isaac Saini. And uh, Isaac, I imagine may touch on some of these points himself, but just to make sure it's, it's all out there for, for your background. So Isaac has roots in Trinidad, Tobago and the Black Nova Scotian community. He is currently director of Dalhousie's Transition Year Program, which was founded in 1970 to redress the educational barriers and injustices that confront the Mi'kmaq Nation, other Indigenous peoples and the African Nova Scotian community. He is chair of Dalhousie's committee, developing what will be the first major in Black and African diaspora studies in Canada. He's also an adjunct professor in history at St. Mary's University. He's a 2019 recipient of the Dalhousie President's Award for the Advancement of Equity, Diversity, and Inclusiveness. He's a community activist, as some of you will be well aware, and a participant in the anti-war movement and the anti-racist struggle. Isaac holds a PhD in history from the School of Oriental and African Studies from the University of London in the UK. His teaching and scholarship encompass Africa, the Caribbean, Cuba, and Black Canadian history in the US civil rights movement. He is the author of the book, Cuba, A Revolution in Motion, and the forthcoming, Cuba, Africa, and Apartheid's and Africa's Children Return. And without further ado, I will now um, turn the floor over to Dr. Saini. And uh, Isaac, I, I look very much forward uh, to your presentation. So please go ahead. Well, thank you all. It's uh, a great pleasure to be here and uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to talk about uh, the development of Black Studies um, at Dalhousie University, and specifically to place it in the context of, of what's unfolding uh, across Canada. So it's a great pleasure to be here. And, uh, and as a historian, I'm going to ground the discussion of uh, building Black Studies, uh, Dalhousie's contribution in a sort of a historical context, which I think uh, is critically important. What really stands out in some ways when we look at Black Canadian studies is that Dalhousie has actually been a leader 
And I'll sort of uh, trace some of this back to actually begin in, in, in the early 60s and so forth, in terms of perhaps laying some very uh, uh, roots and so forth. And then I'll hope take us through some of the history uh, uh, that I think has a, a sort of shaped the context in which uh, Black Canadian studies has evolved but also in a sense also bring it to where we are at in developing the first black and african diaspora studies major i.e the first major uh, in black studies in canada uh, long overdue as many of you probably are aware uh, black studies programs uh, in various various forms black studies africana uh, uh, different labels are uh, given to it uh, numerous throughout the united states and it, quite often black studies in the United States is actually seen as the academic win, wing of the black liberation movement, deeply tied uh, to, to radical black struggles, uh, to realize their humanity and to achieve full citizenship rights. And there were a number of actions that took place by students in the United States in the late 60s, particularly at San Francisco State University, demanding that the Black story be told, demanding that the experience of Black people uh, in the United States uh, be uh, uh, taught at various universities. And it was in San Francisco, San Francisco State that the first Black Studies Department was established. And then we've seen a flourishing of Black Studies programs across the United States. Canada, of course, was a little late in starting. And perhaps, you know, quite often we may think that perhaps there was no sort of radicalization or radical movement among, uh, shall we say, Black students and Black youth at that time or within the Black community that could have generated uh, 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 this drive and this impetus for Black Studies programs. But I, what I'm going to show is actually that even though quite often, you know, there's a fundamental Canadian conceit in a sense that, you know, Canada is not the United States and therefore the problems that exist in the United States don't exist here and Canada perhaps can in a sense have a stance of superiority. We know that not to be true. We know that the same problems of colonization and uh, the same problems of uh, black oppression exist here in Canada, perhaps not to the same degree, but to a significant uh, extent. But also we know historically and that and I tell my students uh, um, in my classes when I do approach the, uh, the 1960s that Canada was not and did not sit uh, shall we say, apart from the tumultuous 1960s. Uh, and in fact, in the iconic year of the 1960s, which is 1968, you know, that is seen as the year of perhaps the greatest tumult, the greatest rebellion uh, uh, in, in, in the 1960s, not just in the United States, not just uh, in Europe, you know, obviously there's a huge uh, strikes that take place in Europe in 1968, but across the world. And Canada was part and parcel of that, and so was the Black community. And I'll chat about that in a bit. Oops. So where I'd like to begin our story, and when we talk about Black Canadian studies, is there is the formal academic black, uh, idea of Black studies where it becomes a discipline and it's embedded in the academy. But the idea of reflecting on the Black experience and what it means to be Black within Canada, uh, I think we can actually uh, say has a long, uh, shall we say, uh, uh, provenance. So, for example, I think, and I can make the argument, and others have made the argument, that when we think about the first reflection of what it means to be a person of Africa, they said within what is going to become Canada. Uh, this is before the official political arrangements that we and state arrangements that we know existing, ex, uh, you know, were created. You know, we know that Canadian history, and this, this can be very political, very politicized, very ideological. What is considered officially part of Canadian history can be very different for various people. And I often point out to my students that the War of 1812 is seen as quintessentially and central uh, to Canadian history, while slavery is often dismissed as not being part of Canadian history because Canada didn't officially become a country until July 1st, uh, um, 1867. This is all very political, all very ideologically driven about what one decides is part of the Canadian narrative and therefore uh, part of shaping the Canada that we have today. I begin with the story of slavery because the first recorded uh, in person we know of enslaved person in Canada is in 1620. There were other people who were enslaved before that, but the first name we have, the first recorded person is Oliver Olivier Lejeune, who was uh, six years old at the time. I won't go into detail about the story. We know he was sold several times and eventually he comes into the possession of our father, Paul Lejeune. And 
Uh, Paul, Father Paul Lejeune, who's a Catholic priest, of course, being a member of the clergy, was no bar uh, to enslaving other human beings, uh, decides, this is on, um, obviously, he's on operating under the, um, under the code, no, uh, the French law this is before, obviously before the code law, but under under French practice, decides to baptize um, Olivia Lejeune. I mean, actually gives him his name. And when he's about to baptize the six-year-old African, whose original name we do not know, uh, it is recorded in his uh, journal that the boy says uh, to him, he says, well, you know, why should I be baptized? And I'm sort of paraphrasing here. And Father Paul Lejeune says, so you can be like me, okay? We can become one in Christ, so to speak, and we can be the same. And the boy perhaps makes perhaps the first quintessential analysis of what it means to be black in Canada when he says, for me to be like you, well, you say that uh, by baptism, uh, uh, we'll be like each other. But for me to be like you, I would have to take the skin off of my bones, right? In a journal, Lejeune treats, treats that as some sort of a really nonsensical reply by the, uh, by the six-year-old. But in reality, when one looks at it, it's pretty prescient and pretty deep and profound for a six-year-old. It sort of indicates perhaps the first deep analysis of, of what it means to be Black in Canada, which is rooted perhaps in a, in a deep structural inequality that exists. Now, I don't have time uh, to talk about the impact of slavery in Canada, but one of the things we do know here at Dalhousie is that we have one one of the leading, if not the leading scholar on slavery in Canada, uh, Dr. Fua Cooper, and her famous book, The Hanging of Angelique, The Untold Story of Canadian Slavery uh, and the uh, Burning of Old Montreal. And she also uh, was the lead scholar on the Lord Dalhousie Report, which basically looked at Dalhousie's university's uh, uh, connections uh, with, the uh, with the transatlantic slavery. And of course, it was, shall we say, the fact that we had uh, in a sense, in a number of uh, scholars who, of Black Canadian history who were here at Dalhousie University, who understood the legacy of slavery, that when Dalhousie was getting ready and gearing up uh, to celebrate its 200th anniversary, a uh, number of us, we had formed the Black faculty uh, and staff caucus, were able to point out to then President Richard Florizon that there were some problem, problems in celebrating the legacy of Lord Dalhousie. And of course, many of us had done the research and we all actually relied significantly on the research of someone who I'll show a photo of later, one of Dalhousie's graduates and so forth. So in terms of developing this body of, uh, of research uh, that will undergird Black Canadian studies as it develops and so forth, uh, particularly as we see a slew of hirings across Canada and also the commitment that has been articulated by many universities to develop Black Studies programs, we will see that there has been the, a, lay, a laying down of the foundation of that studies by a number of scholars who have passed through Dalhousie, either educated here at Dalhousie University or in many cases, uh, you know, have come here to, uh, to basically um, carry on their research. Dr. Fua Cooper, who did a PhD at the University of Toronto, is one of those uh, scholars who've come here, uh, being the third James Robinson Johnson Chair of Black Canadian Studies. And so in explicating how slavery has continued to shape uh, the Black experience in Canada, you know, there have been a number of scholars at Dalhousie University who have done that. Uh, James Walker, for example, who I'll talk about later on, uh, Harvey Amani Whitfield, who's become a leading scholar on slavery, as well as you know, stuff coming out of the Lord Dalhousie report. So Olivia Lejeune, I think in 1620, uh, when, when he's baptized, okay, articulates very clearly and succinctly what we can say in a sense is uh, uh, you know, a, a beginning of an analysis, a statement of what it means to be Black here in Canada. Uh, other scholars are focused on um, the, you know, the fact that there were people like Marianne Shad, right? We can even look at uh, uh, some of the stuff that's actually been uh, written uh, by uh, Richard Preston and petitions and so forth. The work of people like Thomas Peters, who was a representative of the Black Loyalists with 3,500, uh, shall we say, men, flee, uh, men and women who are fleeing slavery uh, in the United States uh, during the American War of Independence who come here and through their petitions articulate uh, what it means to be Black in Canada, what it means even to be normally free and to have their citizenship rights uh, truncated. One person I'd like to talk about here, who I think is a very important person, is Henry Sylvester Williams, the father of Pan-Africanism. 
Now, those of you who are familiar with this idea of Pan-Africanism would know that it speaks about uh, the fact that a commonality exists among people of African descent precisely because of the experience of the transatlantic slave trade and the transatlantic slave system that emerged, as well as colonialism itself. And so despite people coming from different cultures, languages, and ethnicities, and so forth out of Africa, and don't, despite being part of the African diaspora, this common experience of oppression, of marginalization, and disenfranchisement has created sort of uh, what people have argued in the panel is a, a, a commonality, a unity, okay, and therefore a common struggle. Uh, there's a, a Dr. Chike Jeffers has written a lot about this, and he's another uh, scholar here based at, um, here in, in, in uh, at Dalhousie University, a leading for philosopher, uh, um, a philosopher of African studies and so forth. And he himself has spoken uh, and written about this, and other people have spoken about this and have numerous conversations. We see the origin of Pan Africanism as a philosophy, as, uh, as an intellectual tradition in the 19th century. Henry Sylvester Williams uh, can be considered the father of organized. Uh, Pan-Africanism or the father of political Pan-Africanism in the sense that he decides to translate these ideas into a political movement to bring people together. Uh, uh, and he does that in 1900 in London, England, right? Bringing together ver a variety of intellectuals and thinkers. Uh, the great um, American thinker, W. E. Du Bois, uh, comes, uh, goes to that meeting and so forth. And then later on, uh, takes up the mantle of organizing these Pan-African Congresses. What's really interesting about Henry Sylvester Williams is is that he studied at Dalhousie University. He was here for a brief surgeon. He was at the law school uh, here for a brief uh, a surgeon. Uh, he you know, participated in the black community here uh, with his act, um, in Nova Scotia. There's actually a new plaque a beautiful plaque that's been put at the uh, at the in, almost close to the intersection of Falkland Street and Godigan Street uh, to mark the existence of the American Methodist Epis Episcopal Zion Church that existed there. It no longer exists, but that church existed there. It was a very active church in the community. And Henry Sylvester Williams was a member of that church. And he was active in the black community as a whole. And at the same time, he was at Dalhousie University. James Robinson Johnson, who was the first African Nova Scotian to attend Dalhousie University and then graduate. He graduated with a BA and then he graduated with a law degree and became a very well respected criminal and maritime lawyer. Okay. And then it's for him that uh, the, the James Robinson Johnson chair is named after. It's hard to believe that both of these individuals being two of the few black people on campus would not have interacted and had intellectual exchanges, which perhaps would have influenced uh, Henry Sylvester Williams. We know that members of the AME church traveled from Halifax to participate in the conference in London. And here is Henry Sylvester Williams. You see his picture here. And it's hard not to think, even though we don't have the documentation, to think that his ideas at some way, uh, in some way, around Pan-Africanism and basically creating an organized instrument uh, to have those Pan-African ideas translated into reality would not have been influenced by his stay here at Dalhousie University as an interaction with various people. So he is a hero in the story and he is a connection to Dalhousie University. He's often not talked about, he's often forgotten, but there's numerous stories like this. I'm just using him as a really poignant example here. Okay, uh, this is the conference he organized, uh, the first Pan-African Congress uh, from July 23rd to July 25th in 1900. And you can actually go in Westminster and you can actually find uh, a plaque to him. A very interesting individual. As, and in fact, uh, CBC a little while ago did an interview on him, interviewed me, interviewed some other people as well to talk about this profound uh, connection between Canada, Nova Scotia, Halifax, and, and Dalhousie University and the Pan-African movement. So in a sense, what we see is that there are strains of, uh, of, of, of uh, thoughts and, and thinking about what it means to be Black in Canada, in the world, how one should organize, what is the position of people of African descent uh, globally. We see that thinking, uh, we see that activity actually in itself also uh, intersecting with Canada. Now I want to jump a little further, so this, I don't want—I didn't want to give a whole historical lecture when I was putting together this PowerPoint. I realized it was much too long, so I cut a lot of it out. But I want to go back to what I said at the beginning. 
that you know when we look at black studies programs in the United States, we're not surprised by them. There's so many of them. They go by different names, right? And they're often seen as a direct result uh, of the black liberation struggle in the United States. As I said, they're often seen and John Bracy, the late John Bracy, who was a major black studies scholar uh, at the in the University of Massachusetts system, who he just recently passed away, described it as an academic wing of the black liberation struggle. Okay, and then through that they be, they became in constant in in academy and you know began to analyze the experience of black folk from the perspective of the of, of people of african descent in canada we cannot forget that as i said before canada did not sit aside from the 1960s on this slide here we see pictures of, uh, of the Black Writers' Congress. The Black Writers' Congress took place in Montreal in October, uh, October 11th to the October the 14th. It was the largest uh, gathering of revolutionary, Black revolutionary thinkers in North America in the 1960s. Uh, in the top right-hand corner, you see the legendary uh, Walter Rodney. Uh, I think Miriam McKee was there together. I think that's Joan Jones, who was Rocky Jones' wife, okay? Uh, at the bottom here, you see Stokely Carmichael before he became Kwame Ture. Uh, uh, Rosie Douglas is in this picture. Rosie Douglas was a, a Black, a Caribbean student who was a very important in the Black struggle here in Canada, eventually became Prime Minister of, um, of, of Dominica. He was eventually deported from Canada. So the Congress of Black Writers was a very significant gathering, right? And what's important about that is at this gathering was Rocky Jones, the, uh, Burnley Rocky Jones, who will be very important in the story because he's a direct connection to Dalhousie University and a direct connection to sort of uh, uh, laying the seeds for what became uh, the, uh, the development of uh, Black Studies direction and of course now into some of the initiatives we see unfolding at this university at the black writers congress okay not only were these thinkers gathering there but rocky jones was there and he was sort of the nexus between nova scotia the biographical nexus in that sense between nova scotia the black community in nova scotia and the uh, global black liberation struggle <clears throat> particularly as it transformed from the civil rights movement uh, centered around uh you know a non-violence of, of, of Martin Luther King, but more importantly, not just non-violence, but challenging uh, the system for reforms to one that demanded fundamental transformation of the system and began to articulate ideas of Black uh, uh, self-determination and even of a revolutionary challenge to the system. The Black Writers' Congress brought these individuals together from the United States, from Canada, but also for people like CLR James from the Caribbean, but who was an internationalist, and people such as Walter Rodney from Ghana who is very famous for his uh, uh, as a as a not only as a major historian but also as a major organic intellectual. His famous book is How Europe Under Developed Africa, and his uh, collection uh, of of a, a talks called Walter Rodney Speaks when he was at the Institute of the Black World in, in, in middle 1970s is one of the most found, profound works ever written and is one of the most uh, one was is, is one of the works that has shaped me most intellectually. So the Black Writers Congress took place in October. And we have, and um, you can read there's two books I would recommend about that. Uh, one, uh, both of them by David Austin, who's a major scholar in the uh, on in uh, in Montreal of Jamaican ancestry and a, a, a profound and deeply insightful uh, and rich thinker. And so he has two books out that deal with this fear of a black nation, race, sex, and security, 1960s Montreal, that actually won the Casas as America's Prize. And he actually co finally collected all of the speeches and produced an edited version called Moving Against the System, the 1968 Congress of Black Writers in the Making of Global Consciousness. That Canada was part of this global struggle that was unfolding. Canada was part of the revolutionary streams that had developed or rivers that had developed in 1968, with 1968 being this iconic uh, here of rebellion and so forth. What's important about this, how it links to Halifax and to Dalhousie is Rocky Jones, you know, who had become political in, um, in Toronto. You know, he was born in Truro uh, from a poor black working class community in Truro. 
you know, he left that community, you know, he, he talks about the discrimination, the marginalization, uh, you know, racism he faced in Truro. He leaves, and it's in Toronto that it becomes politicized, uh, politicized by witnessing uh, demonstrations uh, that in solidarity with the struggles against uh, segregation in the United States, and also his wife, Joan Jones, who politicizes him by introducing him to a wide set of, of political reading and so forth. Rocky becomes politicized in Toronto becomes involved with the U U.S. Uh, uh, Black liberation struggle, is, is important in the, uh, in the Black Writers' Congress. And Stokely Carmichael, who had coined the famous term, well, he hadn't coined it, but he had made the term Black Power very popular and had become a very major figure uh, in, the, in, 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 the, in the United States, uh, and uh, in fact, a vilified figure. And Rocky Jones himself was often described as being kind of Stokely Carmichael. Rocky and Jones and Stokely Carmichael had a deep friendship, okay, and he spoke about the problems in Nova Scotia, the problems of disenfranchisement, of marginalization, of unemployment, of discrimination, of segregation, of isolation, of these myriad and multifaceted problems and multilayered problems, and Stokely Carmichael said, you know, uh, came for rest and relaxation. It's a very funny story, but came for rest and relaxation that didn't turn into rest and relaxation in Halifax, but saw that Halifax and the Black Nova Scotian community was part of the global Black liberation struggle and promised Rocky Jones uh, that he would send uh, a contingent to a system. At that time, Stokely Carmichael was the chair of the Black Panther Party. And so eight Panthers arrived in Halifax and began assisting in organizing the community. And so they began assisting in organizing the community, traveling back and forth, uh, looking at the problems the black community was facing very soberly uh, and, and very analytically. And they, in a sense, played a very important role in what became at that time in Canadian history, the largest black political gathering, right, of, of black of people of African descent and kind of African Canadians. And that was the November 30th, 1968, uh, uh, black family meeting, which led to the formation of Black United Front. These are some of the historic pictures I have from the archives. You can see Rocky Jones is at the bottom of these pictures, an incredibly charismatic individual. So Rocky Jones is involved in the uh, in the global Black liberation struggle. Uh, he comes to Halifax in the mid 60s, returns to Halifax in the mid 60s, determined to help carry on the struggle here. Uh, to, in a sense, to uh, organize the Black community, to be able to analyze and think about the conditions of oppression. Why are they oppressed? Uh, what is the nature of the oppression? And what means can they overcome that oppression and marginalization? He establishes something called, uh, a meeting place called Quatcher House. And there's a very good documentary uh, that on um, NFB called Encountered Quatcher House. So that becomes a place where people come to think and analyze uh, the Black condition, right? And within all of that, you know, he invites the Panthers come to Halifax. This Black family meeting takes place, right? And therefore, and, and when you read the, the literature, it basically uh, is uh, this meeting that takes place on October, uh, November 30th, uh, 1968. There's a close to 500 people from a variety of Black communities who are selected as delegates to arrive into the North Branch Library and begin talking about the Black condition, talking about how to organize uh, in order to transform the conditions of the Black communities and so forth. And that, in a sense, you know, as one uh, uh, participant, uh, uh, George uh, Frank Boyd said at that time, he said, you know, we were, you know, we, we were overcome because we were tasting Black liberation at the center of Halifax and so forth. So there's all of this revolutionary tumult uh, that's taking place in Halifax. We organized an event, uh, uh, in uh, for the 50th anniversary uh, in 2018 uh, 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 to mark the 50th anniversary, you know, Revolution in Halifax, Halifax and Revolution, to talk about the significant impact that had. And one of the impacts is not just the fact that it was for a short space of time, uh, in a sense, a revolutionary festival, right, of the Black community here. There was also a very significant intellectual impact, okay, uh, um, because Rocky Jones not only uh, participated in organizing these events, but he also organized the African Canadian Liberation Movement, right, uh, that was very active in, 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 the, in the early to mid-1970s. And there were a whole group of young people, right, uh, from the Black community who became educated in his home, on Pepperell Street and other places where he lived, where the kitchen became sort of like an informal university where people would be given uh, books to read, where these discussions would take place. People would talk about Franz Fanon, 
for example. They talk about Du Bois. They talk about um, a whole number of other black, uh, Sto the work of Stokely Carmichael. They speak about the work of Walter Rodney. And so these discussions would take place. And so in a sense, while this is not a formal, in a sense, black studies curriculum, you begin to, at the end of the day, begin to have a, a, a bunch of young people who become deeply influenced by what is unfolding there. So while I've often argued that while the political goals uh, that Rocky hoped to achieve, which were revolutionary, perhaps never came to fruition, the deeper impact was specifically in the cultural and educational front, which I think in the case of Dalhousie in Halifax laid the basis for some of the powerful initiatives uh, that formally established uh, uh, Black Studies first as courses um, in, um, in, 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 the, in the university, and then later on, right, uh, as we begin to develop uh, formal positions and programs. I encourage people to read um, Rocky Jones's uh, memoir, uh, Revolutionary. I'm gonna be quoting from it in a second because one of the important things is as Rocky is doing this, right? Uh, Rocky is also thinking about his education. And so he tells of a story where there is a, 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 a gathering, a meeting to talk about the Vietnam War, because this is the 60s. And Rocky speaks so eloquently that then the president of Dalhousie University, Henry Hicks, says to him, no, that was extremely well said. You should think, have you been to university? And Rocky says, well, no, I haven't been to university. And he said, well, you should consider coming to Dalhousie University. And then what happens is Rocky later takes up Hicks. He goes to his office and says, you remember me? And Henry Hicks says, yes, I remember me. He says, well, you remember what you promised me? What you told me. And he said, no, I don't. And he says, well, you know, you said I, I, I should come to that house university. Hicks tries to talk him out of that because he sees him as too radical, right? Because, you know, and so on, right? Because he hadn't really actually meant it. He tries to convince him to go to St. of X, but Rocky Jones eventually convinces him. Uh, you know, Hicks says to him, listen, why don't you take a course in the summer? If you pass that course, do well in it in the summer, then you can come to that house university. Rocky takes a course, does well in the course, and then uh, uh, begins attending Dalhousie in September. Rocky talks about, and this is very important, he talks about his relationship with James Walker. So you see James Walker there with him. James Walker was his closest friend. Uh, James Walker is now a professor emeritus at uh, what, uh, University of Waterloo, Waterloo University. But he is also was a PhD student at Dalhousie at that time. He becomes a PhD student. Rocky had met him earlier, but they had reconnected and began to forge their friendship here at Dalhousie University. James Walker is one of the founders of Black Canadian Studies, a very critical uh, thinker. He has written significantly about the Black Loyalists. This is the migration of 3,500 at least uh, uh, plus uh, uh, men and women who come and with their children who come after the War of Independence, after the British have made promises uh, in, uh, during the American War of Independence that enslaved Africans who joined them or any Black person who joins them uh, in their struggle against the rebellion and colonists uh, will be given freedom, land, and equality. And eventually, when the British lose, they you know they take three thousand five hundred of them, at, at least three thousand five hundred of them, end up coming to Nova Scotia. And we can talk in that story. We can explore in the questions afterwards. Uh, James Walker has perhaps written the definitive book on them, uh, the Black Loyalists: Search for a Promised Land, uh, which was based on his PhD dissertation he was doing at Dalhousie University. So Rocky and James Walker forged a very deep relationship, right? But when Rocky enrolled at Dalhousie University, he ended up taking a course, okay, with the gentleman here on the right. This is George Shepperson. George Shepperson is a renowned Africanist, right? A renowned scholar of the, of the African diaspora. I mean, he focused a lot of his work on Malawi, but he wrote a lot about the African diaspora and African-American politics, right? He was visit, a visiting professor at Dalhousie University for one year. You know, he, you know, he, he taught at various universities in Britain, you know, ending his career at the University of Edinburgh. In fact, he only died um, uh, in 2020. He died at the age of 98. And so he was a, he was a formative shaper of Rocky Jones's thinking. And in a sense, he is the first evidence of what can be said to be a, a, a bona fide Black Studies course at Dalhousie University. Not simply a course on Africa, but a course on the experience of people of African descent, both in Africa and the African diaspora. And he was concerned about how Africans and people of African descent saw and understood the experiences. This is how Rocky Jones describes the experience, and I'm quoting. That fall, I took the most fascinating history course you can imagine. It was taught by George Shepperson, an eminent scholar who came to Dalhousie for one year as the Canada Council Visiting Professor. The course content was perfect for me. Africa and the African diaspora. 
It was a graduate student, graduate course with PhD students in it. I went to Dr. Shepperson and told him about the reading I was doing and the community things I was involved in and how I'd really like to take this class. And of course, he allowed him to take the class, right? And in fact, as, Rock, as, as Rocky would say, quite often he would be talking about the, the Black experience in Nova Scotia and tying it in to the material he was dealing with in that course. Rocky goes on to say, that class was the most exciting educational experience of my life. First of all, all the readings overlapped with what I was doing already, and it furthered my thinking about the international history of African Africans. The discussions were so stimulating that Shepherdson would challenge any, everything. You couldn't get away with sloppy reading or sloppy arguments. You couldn't say anything you couldn't back up. It was just knock down, take off your gloves, and when you, come, when, when you came in the door. For me, it was an intellectual awakening that was profound. I had the chance to read, to challenge, and to be challenged, to exchange ideas with some really bright students. I was the only Nova Scotian there, but Shepherdson included Nova Scotia in our readings and discussions. We examined the racism faced by Black people throughout our history, the attempts to overcome it, the problems we faced, and the historical background. My understandings of the diaspora and even of my home province was expanded that year. There's no way I could bring out the excitement for someone who wasn't there. And I was doing this while some other very exciting things were going on. And so here we have, in a sense, the first concrete example of what can be said to be a Black Studies course and a Black Studies discourse taking place. Shepperson, of course, was there for only one year. But in the course of um, taking that course, Rocky reconnected, as I said, with James Walker, who was now doing his PhD. Uh, and his PhD was focusing on the Black loyalists. And together, they be began a very close relationship. And was out of their thinking and musings uh, and, and working with uh, other progressive students and administration at Dalhousie University that the transition year program was formed. And the TYP was formed, okay, as it, uh, which is a program I now direct and have been teaching in for a very long time, was formed specifically uh, to address issues that were affecting the indigenous, but particularly the Mi'kmaq and the African Nova Scotian community. And, of, and in that program, <clears throat> they had courses taught <clears throat> on African diaspora literature, on the black, black experience in Canada and so forth. So for a long time, you know, after Shepherdson left, the only courses that would address the black experience within Canada, okay, existed um, in the transition year program for a very long period of time. Now, some of you who have been here as long as I have, and, um, and perhaps longer will remember that Dalhousie University had a very active center uh, of African studies, a very, uh, uh, very, and it, you know, we had at one point in the 1980s and 1990s, you had the major scholars on Africa <clears throat> coming to Dalhousie University, and particularly as the anti-apartheid struggle was going on, uh, and it's Saul Dubal, Shula Marx, uh, 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 Omera, so many of these major scholars, right, who, who came here, right, and so in a sense, Dalhousie was an, ex uh, uh, was an exciting area for the study of Africa, I mean, but what's important here is that the experience of people of African descent living in Canada, living in the diaspora, in a sense, was only particularly addressed in courses in the transition year program. And of course, you know, I always like to make this point, uh, put this point out that because the only Black Studies course existed in the transition year program, and even though the transition year program perhaps now has a certain cachet at Dalhousie, uh, you know, it was when I first joined so long ago, it was looked down upon as the lowest of the programs at Dalhousie that these students wouldn't even, shouldn't even be here at Dalhousie. University, and therefore these faculty members who were teaching there were substandard and shouldn't even be here as faculty. It's a long story I can tell. So in a sense, Black Studies itself, uh, uh, even though it existed in the transition year program, uh, was diminished, right, and even demeaned, right, uh, uh, in terms of people seeing it as a real academic endeavor. So in many ways, when you look at um, Black Studies itself, right, uh, in Canada, right, it suffered in comparison to the valorization of Black studies, and I, I don't want to overstate the case, in the United States. Of course, we have some key figures, because as George Eliot Clark, and this is George Eliot Clark, people are very familiar with him, he just put on a wonderful show at the, at the, at the Central Library of Five Poets Broken Into Song. George Eliot Clark, um, as an as a, uh, alumnus of Dalhousie University, become central in beginning to construct Black studies, but Black studies as it relates to Canada. 
what's important about George is George is one of these pupils, one of these students of, uh, of uh, uh, Rocky Jones. Uh, in his latest uh, memoir, Beauty Survives, where he talks about his early youth, right? And his relationship with his father, his relationship with the community and so forth. George speaks about how Rocky Jones and John Jones transformed his consciousness and so forth. And in many ways, the person he is today, his ability to articulate about the Black experience, his passion, his insights, right? Uh, uh, shaped by that experience with Rocky Jones and so on. Uh, George did his master's here in English, you know, his PhD, uh, did his master's, he did his PhD at Queens, okay, but his, did his master's here in English, and he has become a major shaper of Black Canadian studies. And I often likes to point out is that many of the initiatives that we see at Dalhousie, so for example, uh, when we look at some of the initiatives that were done um, in the school of, um, of the Maritime School of Social Work, which also begin to initiate courses that look at, looked at the Black experience, a lot of that is linked to what happened in the 60s. It's linked to Rocky Jones's uh, not only legacy, but his continual active involvement in trying to push Black studies and establish it within uh, the academy, within Dalhousie University, to push it out of where it had been sidelined in the transition year program. George Eliot Clark has founded, I could, you could say, the discipline of African-Canadian literature, the study of African-Canadian literature, and it continues to be uh, you know, a profound influence. And and he himself, as I said, is shaped within Halifax and is a graduate of Dalhousie University. Wanda Thomas Bernard, who was the, uh, not a senator, Wanda Thomas Bernard, uh, director of the School of uh, Maritime School of Social Work uh, over, over, uh, over several cycles, right? Uh, she played an important role in establishing uh, a variety of courses, right? Holding conferences and so forth uh, um, that basically began to at least if, uh, make the study of the Black experience as it exists within Nova Scotia, as within in Canada, uh, an acceptable academic uh, focus. Uh, we have the establishment in 1996 of the James Robinson Johnson Chair of Black Canadian Studies. Rocky Jones played an important role in that, as did others, right? The idea was that, you know, in, uh, funding took place nationally and the decision was made, where do we establish a chair of Black Canadian Studies, okay? It was named after James Robinson Johnson, who was the first African Nova Scotian graduate of Dalhousie University. Okay, and then graduate as a lawyer, and then, and of course, that's why it was. Uh, so it was named after him when it was decided that it should be at Dalhousie University because it should be at Dalhousie as the flagship university of the Maritimes, but also because, in a, historically, this is where we have the beginning of the black presence, right, of what we can say blackness within Canada. You see uh, the four holders of the chair. The first one is Esmeralda Thornhill, who was based in the law school held the chair for six years, 1996 to 2002. Uh, she held a very important conference in the run-up to the Durban conference. Uh, people may be familiar, but that was a critically, uh, a, a critically historical conference that took place at the end of August, early September in 2001 in, in Durban, South Africa, the United Nations Conference uh, Against Racism, Xenophobia, and Other Related Intolerance. It was a major defeat uh, for many of the Western powers and central issues of reparations and some other issues as well. Uh, it was a major news story. But of course, people have forgotten about it because obviously just shortly afterwards, there was 9-11, uh, which transformed the geo geopolitical uh, power relations, right? And the Women Conference, while not forgotten, its impact was, uh, in a sense, diluted by that. Uh, she, uh, um, uh, uh, Professor Thornhill, organized a major conference, uh, basically to bring together the Canadian delegations and to bring together Canadians, right, across Canada to talk about the Black experience experience in Canada, because at this time, there'd been a special reporter from the uh, United Nations who had traveled through Canada and actually did a report on the conditions of people of African descent, right, uh, at that time, pointing out the disenfranchisement, the marginalization, the fact that people of African descent fell at the bottom of the socioeconomic ladder, all of these problems that people think are only manifest in the United States, the UN re uh, special reporter sort of demonstrated they existed here in Canada. And so this conference that was held uh, in 2001 in the run-up to the August conference in Durban, which uh, was to bring Canadians from across uh, uh, um, across the country to talk, uh, Black Canadians across the country, to talk about the Black experience, to, to, uh, uh, to, to basically 
uh, speak about the impact of slavery, to speak about the impact of segregation, to speak about the impact of the problematic claim on citizenship rights and so forth, in a sense to basically analyze the Black experience, right, and in order to sort of uh, put forward possible solutions or possible paths of, of action and so forth. And so that was a very important gathering, right, that took place. Uh, uh, the second chair, David Devine, uh, who occupied the chair, unfortunately had a terrible accident that shortened his tenure. Uh, he played a very important role, bringing, uh, organizing several conferences, the Lenses conferences, uh, basically, which were about, uh, in many ways, looking at the Black experience and carrying on the work that Esmeralda Thornhill had done, bringing together uh, Black thinkers, bringing together Black academics who had been writing perhaps disparately and isolated, okay, to bring these intellectuals together uh, to talk about the Black experience in a coherent and, uh, and, and productive fashion. The third chair, some oh, everyone knows, Dr. Fua Cooper, um, held the chair, and she was very important before she held the chair in um, being one of the founding members and the key mover of founding the Black Canadian Studies Association, uh, which I'll come to later on, which was break, which was the first formal association of, 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 of Black academics, right, uh, who were study the Black Canadian experience. And uh, I was a founding member of that association and on the executive up until 2017. Uh, um, and so this was a very important organ organization. And we have the now current chair, Dr. Omasori Dryden, who took over the presidency of the Black Canadian Studies Association, and is now, when we come to it, is leading the Black, the is not only the current James Robinson Johnson chair, but leading very important research on the impact on Black health of, um, a whole variety of socioeconomic factors and so on, and is also leading uh, the Black Studies Research Institute that was just recently established, and I'll get back to that in a bit. Uh, here we have, um, I think, some key players in Black Canadian studies. Uh, uh, the, uh, we have Harvey Amani Whitfield. I mentioned him before. He's a leading scholar. Uh, on the Black experience in Canada, uh, particularly as another wave of Black uh, migration which took place after the War of 1812, which we often refer to as the Black refugees, but also specifically on slavery. Uh, he did his PhD here at Dalhousie University, so he's a Dalhousie alumnus. His book, Blacks on the Border, which is about this group of 2,000 or more people of African descent who ended up coming to Nova Scotia and other parts of Canada, but particularly to Nova Scotia after the War of 1812, uh, that was what his PhD was, that was based on his PhD dissertation, and he continues to be a major scholar. Dr. Claudine Bonner, who is now the VP of Inclusion Equity at uh, and a CRC at the KJ University, uh, she actually did one of her graduate degrees here at Dalhousie University, right? Okay, and she's become a major a, 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 a scholar on Black migration, right? Some of the migrations we don't know about. Uh, the migrations, not just uh, um, from the Caribbean or from Africa uh, to Canada and Nova Scotia in particular, but specifically the migrations that take place and the exchanges of people that take place between Nova Scotia and, uh, and for example, New England and so on. And so she has been deepening a lot of this research. And in fact, you know, a lot of a historical, uh, uh, historical training, a lot of it, a significant portion uh, uh, and work uh, took place here as a graduate student at Dalhousie University. And of course, Dr. Chike Jeffers uh, you know, did his PhD at Northwestern University, but is a leading scholar on W. Du Bois and a leading um, a scholar in Africana philosophy. What's important about Chike as well is he's also conceptualized Black Canadian philosophy, right? He's talked about that. In fact, there's an essay, Do We Need Black Canadian Philosophy? Which first asked the question, is there such a thing as Black Canadian philosophy? And if it does exist, what is Black Black Canadian philosophy and how is it important in understanding not only the Black experience, but the Black Canadian experience. Uh, to, he and George Elliott Clark, together with a graduate student of as his, whose name escapes me at the moment, are working on a collection of uh, uh, collected uh, work of Black Canadian philosophical thinkers, going back to people who we would not think of as philosophers, right, in the formal sense. People like Marianne Shad, for example, who edited a newspaper um, in the middle 19th century. Uh, and I would even think some of the people like McCarrow, uh, who wrote uh, a history of the Baptist Church in Nova Scotia and other thinkers, right? And so they're putting together that guide. And the argument specifically, I think when we think about that is 
when people used to subsume the black experience in Canada in the African-American experience. There's a book uh, called The Black Atlantic. There's a work done by Paul Gilroy, who's a major thinker on what's called the Black Atlantic. So people are familiar with Atlantic history, the idea that you know, we, have a hist we have historical connections that tie both sides of the Atlantic Oceans or both land masses and, and peoples on the Atlantic Ocean. There's also the idea there's a, there's a specific Atlantic history around what's called the Black Atlantic, Black communities on both sides of the Atlantic who were tied together by a common historical experience that may differ in degree, but have profound similarities, the cultural links the, and so forth, the common experiences that people of African descent have in a variety of countries. And Gilroy spoke about that. He was a theorizer about the Black Atlantic, but he left Canada out of it. Canada was simply seen as an adjunct of the United States experience, that if you understand it, understood the African-American experience, you understood the Canadian experience. Uh, Chike here at Dalhousie University and other scholars like Dr. Fuo Cooper and so forth, are challenging that by showing there's something unique about the Black Canadian experience. There's something that it says, not just about what it means to be a person of African descent in the Americas and in the diaspora, but also in terms of Canadian studies, there's something that the Black Canadian experience says about Canada itself. So just as you can't understand fully Canadian history without understanding the history of people of African descent here in Canada, the corollary of that is you can't understand fully the Black experience in Canada if you don't understand Canadian history. And so we often in this uh, in this collection they're putting together, they're going to look at how Black Canadians have developed very profound ways of looking at the Black experience here in Canada and in the diaspora, but how they're part of Canadian intellectual traditions and have critiqued those intellectual traditions and in some cases attempted to try and transform them. Of course, a key moment, uh, obviously in the in the recent past, has been the George Floyd uprising, the George Floyd rebellions, the George Floyd movements. Now we're coming up on uh, three years soon, in a few months, there'll be three years since George Floyd uh, was brutally murdered. And three years that those massive demonstrations broke out, those uprisings broke out. And what was important about that is that while they were black led, they were multiracial and multigenerational. They were the largest demonstrations in US history. Over 30 million people are estimated to have actually poured into the streets. But what was interesting from a Canadian perspective was that these demonstrations resonated here. There were huge demonstrations here. And it was a demonstration not simply in solidarity with what was unfolding in the United States, but also highlighting that the same problems exist here in Canada. Uh, the same problems of over-incarceration, the same problems of impoverishment, the same problems of over-policing in terms of the street checks and carding that you have in Toronto, right? And that these problems had been articulated many times over and over again uh, by the Black community. I mean, I was part of a, a group that was working on over-policing of, of Black bodies here in Halifax. Uh, we applied for got some information, it was incomplete, and we were able to demonstrate that, you know, uh, if you are Black, you are more than three times as likely to be stopped by the police. This was ignored. When Scott Wortley was brought in, who was a very competent, very good uh, researcher from the University of Toronto, and he did his work demonstrating that it was actually worse, you were six times more likely to be harassed by the police if you were Black, that was accepted, right? Okay, and so on. So what happened was that, you know, people perhaps, you know, you know, had been saying these things for a very long time, had been ignored, but the George Floyd uh, uprisings, you know, placed this fully on the Canadian agenda, right? And coming out of this, you know, we've had a number of um, initiatives, right? At Dalhousie University, for example, we had the passing on June the 8th of 2020 of two resolutions, uh, both call one calling for the establishment of Black Studies Research Institute, which has now been formally established and is now being, uh, you know, basically fully articulated by uh, Dr. Omosori Dryden and the idea that we should develop a Black and African diaspora studies major. This major, uh, which I have been the chair of uh, the committee, okay, began really as a minor in a sense. Uh, we had the minor formally established in 2017. This was the work of Dr. Fua Cooper. My, I was uh, alongside myself, 
Chike Jefferson and others. She played the key, uh, a major role, the key role. And when we established the major, the idea naturally flowed. Why, uh, the minor, once we established the minor, the idea naturally occurred, we should have a major. We should have a black studies de degree program here because each of us had a collections on our desks of various books that listed how many black studies programs and degrees existed in the United States. They were too numerous to list. We don't have one in Canada. Okay, we didn't even, the first minor was the one established at Dalhousie University. People had courses, they had certificates, they had diplomas, but there wasn't a minor. So once the minor was established, the idea of establishing a major um, uh, emerged. And the first meeting to really begin that process occurred in November of 2019, hosted in the TYP house in our up, small upstairs office. And we brought together a committee, uh, Dr. Chike Jeffers, Vincent Simado, Dr. Fua Cooper, uh, Teresa Rajak Tali uh, uh, joined us because she is a professor of Pan African Studies and we wanted her guidance. Uh, Roberta Barker, um, who was serving as acting dean, joined us and she did tremendous work and so forth. And we began, and Asha Jeffers, okay, uh, who had just been hired, right? And we began uh, putting this together. Of course, the pandemic inter uh, um, interrupted. Uh, there was a what I like to call a nexus moment. And then in March of, um, of last year, we really began pursuing in earnest, right? And so we're now on the verge of, of and, and of course, with the strength of the resolution, we're now on the verge of launching, um, uh, of, of doing five hires across the university. Uh, one is gonna be in FAST, we'll have uh, one, uh, one in law, one in management, uh, one in science and one in health will take place. The one in FAST is obviously going to be critical because this is going to be a program that's primarily FAST based and so forth, as most of these programs are. And we know we're in the process. We just got uh, faculty, uh, the FAST faculty approval. So now we'll be moving on to Senate uh, and the program. I, I hope I'm not violating any confidentiality has received some very good external reviews be, and it will be the first of its nature here in Canada, right? And a direct outcome of, I would say, this line and train of struggle that traces back at least to the 1960s. Uh, I'm drawing here, we've done several presentations on this, and I have to, at the stage, uh, sing out the praises uh, to the people who have uh, provided not just support, but have been central to this. Uh, Lindsay Dubois, the, uh, the assistant dean, has been incredibly supportive, and her work has been in, uh, in terms of actually being there uh, as we work through what we needed to, to do. Uh, you know, Courtney Sutton has been, in, has been incredible in navigating us through the process, understanding what needs to be done in order to get us not just through Senate, but through the Maritime Provincial Higher Education Council, and uh, as well as um, you know, Elizabeth Gillis, okay, and and you know Angela Siegel, and uh, the, the, and we've had tremendous support from Dean uh, Jennifer Andrews, right? So this has been a collective effort. Um, I've often seen as the figurehead, uh, and because people see me more often talking about this, I see myself. Uh, but I've learned a tremendous amount, and without that assistance of of those individuals around me, right, uh, who have done incredible work, I don't think we would be where we are today. What we have in front of us, we do a PowerPoint. Point. And this is one of the slides from that PowerPoint when we talk about it. And this is basically says what will happen, okay, when a student goes through, what will they learn? You know, everybody, I know learning outcomes can be controversial, uh, depending on which faculty you are, but we expect that these students will come out with a broad understanding of the Black experience of people here in Canada. That is something unique about the Canadian experience, right? The Canadian experience is not simply a distillation and a pale reflection of the United States experience. It has something very profound to say about what it means to be black uh, um, in, 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 uh, in, in the world, and in, in the diaspora. And more importantly, because we're rooted in Nova Scotia, and as was acknowledged by Dave here, not only do we sit on the, the land of the unceded territory of the, of the Mi'kmaq people, we also sit in a territory in which black folks were settled upon. Uh, you know, they would, there are many of them who arrived here, either as enslaved Africans or people fleeing from the United States, for example, uh, you know, arrived here as displaced persons and have established a distinct, unique uh, culture, a unique history. Uh, in fact, some could even argue uh, a quasi-nationhood, right? And so the understanding of the African Nova Scotian community is going to be critically important here because it's also a unique experience. In fact, the largest Back to Africa movement uh, took place here from Nova Scotia. And of course, the look at the issues around social justice inequality, 
And of course, within this, we're embedded in the, in the academy, the various disciplines, the various forms of scholarship research and theoretical tools that will be used to explicate, to understand and explore the Black experience. So those are sort of the central things we expect students to get out of the Black Studies program. This gives you a sense of the courses that have been created. So we've created four distinct courses. There will be an introduction course to the Black and African diaspora. Uh, uh, there's the, in, the current existing introduction to African Canadian studies will all, also become part of the BFAD uh, suite of courses. There's an African Nova Scotian history course, as well as a capstone course. And there's actually what I don't have here. There's also an honors course as well, uh, and a research methods course that's not included here, which I forgot to include. And out of this, from the variety of groups courses that exist as well, we have been able uh, from these courses to create at the stage what are these selected groups and so forth the students can will be able to take. We hope that coming out of this, right, okay, that you know we've adopted what's called a living tree uh, metaphor, right, that this will be organic as it develops, right, that the establishment of Black and African diaspora studies program will spur the development of new content, more courses on African Nova Scotian history and the African Nova Scotian experience, new courses specifically on gender and women's experience, courses specifically dealing uh, with the Black queer experiences as well, right? And it will also increase in its interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary components. It's already an interdisciplinary degree because it's going to be based in FAST across different departments, but we also have a course on health, and so we hope, open, hope to also bring other courses from other faculties to play and, and to, to, uh, to bear as well. And of course, we expect the minor to be reinvigorated by the major, but more importantly, we hope to create certificates and diplomas within the major itself. So people from outside of Dalhousie or outside of FAS uh, can do a diploma, a certificate uh, uh, in, in Black and African diaspora studies. Uh, in a sense, make it much more ecumenical, much more accessible and so forth. And so we will be the first Black studies degree. The idea is to have a soft lunch, depending on how uh, the timetable works through Senate and then through MPHEC. In, in September 2003 and to build the program as we go forward, but we will be the first. And one of the interesting things was in the wake of George Floyd, so many universities came out with their commitment to establish Black Studies programs, with their commitment uh, to have hires and so forth, okay? But in terms of the Black Studies programs, you know, many of them uh, you know, really had announced them before they had began developing them. Dalhousie would be the first. We were the first minor, and it looks like we'll be the first major. And in fact, myself and others who have been involved in Black Studies at Dalhousie University have been invited by several universities to actually speak about uh, Black Studies as a discipline and Black Studies as, shall we say, as, you know, as a concrete endeavor within the academy as one begins establishing these programs. I'd like to end on this slide here. Uh, I spoke about the living tree. Uh, this is a quote from Marcus Garvey. Marcus Garvey, uh, a very complex, very profound uh, individual, led the largest uh, international mass movement of people of African descent in history. Uh, over 750,000 card-carrying members with probably hundreds of thousands of more, if not millions of people who were ideological uh, so fellow travelers of that movement. Uh, over 500 chapters and branches established all over the world, okay? And a very significant movement Okay, and one of his quotes was a people without the knowledge of their past history, orange origin and culture is like a tree without roots. And in a sense, I think that in a way in, in encompasses a fundamental component of what will be our living tree conception, right? As we move forward in developing black and African diaspora studies, as we move forward in basically taking the lead, I think, in black studies in Canada, but more importantly, I think, aiding other uh, universities, other academies in also developing their own Black Studies programs as well. And also more importantly, contributing to understanding the Black experience in Canada, uh, to el uh, elucidating the humanity of people of African descent and to articulate that Black liberation, Black freedom, Black advancement uh, only redounds for the benefit of all of humanity. Thank you. Isaac, wow, what a fantastic presentation. Thank you so much, first of all, for taking the time to put it together for tonight, for doing such an excellent job of, of walking us through a fascinating and, and poignant history. And I, I had very little idea of the connections to Dalhousie. So thank you for, for doing that. And also thank you on behalf of everybody for the work you've done in, in advancing the status and 
in the development of this program. I, I, I think you've, you've definitely been instrumental as have many others, but um, this fantastic work and thank you so much. Uh, we do have time, um, and 